Hello, welcome to Rappler Talk. I'm Marites Vitug. Joining us is historian and writer Manuel Quezon III, or Manolo as we call him. Manolo writes a column for the Philippine Daily Inquirer and host, hosts a podcast, The Explainer. I will be talking to Manolo about the return of the Marcoses to the political scene. Manolo has been closely watching and studying the Marcoses for a long time. Thank you, Manolo, for making time for this interview. Thanks for having me. Okay, this is going to be exciting. As we were talking earlier about, um, we are seeing the return of the Marcoses to the political scene, and Bongbong has, Marcos has been leading the surveys, although some people say they never left. But why are, are the Marcoses so popular 35 years after they were thrown out of Malacanang? Well, let's, let's contextualize the, the, the issue. The Marcoses are still trying to achieve um, rehabilitation and vindication. Um, they have gotten as far as successfully returning to power in Ilocos Norte, and they have managed to be elected to national office, which is the Senate, as the step to the presidency. But we cannot forget that... Um, Senator Marcos lost his bid to become vice president. Um, so in a sense, that's um, the first defeat he suffered since the 1990s. Um, and it's not anywhere sure, um, even though right now he is the man to beat, uh, when it comes to the pre seeking the presidency. Now, what do we have going on here? First of all, we have a long tradition of using the ballot as a kind of Mr. Clean Magic, you know, all stains removal mechanism. Um, in other words, eh, for our past leaders who uh, encountered controversy, the way to vindicate yourself was through election. Most famously, President Laurel, who was the president during the war, um, tried to be elected to the presidency again in 1949. Uh, he failed, but he achieved election to the Senate. I um, mean, the same case you saw it with the um, with the family of uh, President Estrada. Each election after Edsa Dos was viewed as a vindication and a rehabilitation of their family. Um, to a certain extent, even you you can see the whole political career of Nino Yakino was based on trying to vindicate and rehabilitate their family name because his father had been very unpopular during the Japanese occupation. So, but uh, with the Marcoses, it's been 36, 35 years since EDSA won when they fled uh, the Philippines. What led to this kind of uh, surge of popularity? Is this because we have a new generation of voters? Or maybe you could walk us through the reasons because we have no history books that really discuss uh, martial law. Okay, let's let's start with nine, in 1986. After being in power for for so many years, the Marcoses flee into exile um, with some of their jewelry and diaper boxes, everything. But uniquely, they were chased out of the country uh, by their own countrymen. Now, the Marcoses argue that what they had wanted to do was simply buy time and go to Ilocos Norte. Um, Mrs. Aquino did not allow uh, the Marcoses to go to the Ilocos and said if they're going to leave Malacanang, they have to leave the country because they were afraid of a civil war happening. And so that's our starting point. Let's not forget that however way you look at it, the snap election was a division of the country. Um, all the witnesses and everything at the time will tell you that the Marcoses lost that election, but by how much, we can always argue that it, you know, it was still a close election. At the very least, there was a big chunk of the Filipino people who stayed loyal to the Marcoses up to the very end. And in fact, when the Marcoses were in exile, uh, President Marcos was still funding uh, political efforts to try to bring him back and take down the government that had ousted him. So we have a situation where, number one, there is 
a strong base of loyalists. We have a word for it, the loyalists, for the Marcoses. The loyalists were always there. Now, when there was the first uh, post-EDSA presidential election in 1992, you had two candidates who divided the loyalist vote, Danding Juanco on one side and Imelda Marcos on the other. What we forgot, because FVR, President Ramos, won that election, was that if the Imelda and Danding votes had been combined, they would have won the presidency. So six years after EDSA, they, if they had uh, learned and kept united, they could have regained power. The thing is, um, they didn't and they failed. But my, my belief is they learn from this and that um, after that, you'll find a consistent effort. Now, the Marco says, if you're looking at the scene, um, some of you will be old enough if you're, if you're my age, up to the early 90s, the late 80s, they were still selling postcards on the streets where it was the official portrait of, of Ferdinand and Imelda, but with horns and fangs. That's how hated uh, they were at the time. You'll remember this. But something happened in the 1990s. There was a documentary that was made um, about Imelda. And my, my argument is that when this documentary was made, it was so entertaining. It was so engrossing. It removed the horns and the fangs from Imelda. Because if you watched it, you would find her so crazy and so charming and so vivid that you wouldn't, you know, the edge was taken off. And in fact, I have a, a you know, I never forgot what a millennial friend said around, said around that time, which was, you know, the difference between your generation, speaking to people like me who were old enough during EDSA and his generation was, he said, for our generation, Imelda is not a political figure. She's a celebrity. And that is an entirely different um, world, you know. So, and with it becomes sort of the removal of one on one part uh, of, of the whole political baggage and the, and the hatred. The creation of a whole new image. Remember, Imelda on one hand is being repopularized by a documentary and her grandson Borgi is on the billboards all over Metro Manila. Mm -hmm. And the whole judge, uh, the whole st uh, standard for the Marcoses is no longer political; it's it's cultural. And then after that comes the efforts to try to win back political legitimacy, so they can run all they want in their home provinces, and of course they will win. But the first time uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. tries to run for the Senate, he doesn't make it. Now I've been. Count, looking at the votes that they got over the years, mm -hmm. and if you look at the votes that Ferdinand Jr. got in the 1990s and again in the 2010s when he finally made it to the Senate, if you look at his sister's uh, votes, roughly speaking, the vote bank or the number of votes that the Marcoses get is about 30%. That means 70% didn't vote for them, mm -hmm. but 30% do. And that 30% is not only enough to get you to the Senate, but in a, in a not-so-crowded year, just another 9% and you're in Malacanang. But, and here's the final thing we, we forget. In our, in, our, in our democracy now, since EDSA, majorities do not rule. Our presidents, all of them since 1992, have been elected by minorities. So you don't need to convince all of the voters or even a majority of the voters. You just need a bigger minority than the next minority. And that is much easier to do um, uh, in terms of the Marcoses. Now, besides being, being, making the shift from just politics to, to you know, uh, culture and, and that sort of thing, the Marcoses also basically figured out we lost the whole generation that was alive during martial law. So that's everyone from maybe uh, my age, if you're in your, er in your late 40s, early 50s, to those in their 70s. That's the whole generation the Marcos has said, okay, th they were the ones out in the streets. Um, but more than half of the population now are, are what? Below 30. 
And that's where they have been concentrating on. I remember running into uh, Amy Marcos in 2010 in Lawag. And she said, well, you know, I'm investing in apps. And um, before that, we knew that they were, they were starting to, to have videos on YouTube. Um, you talked to uh, a colleague was telling me that the games developers in the Philippines are all phenomenally loyal to uh, Aimee Marcos because the Marcoses were, were funding these developers mm -hmm. when no one else would. So there is a certain amount of forward thinking foresight. Um, someone else about about 2012 or 2013 once sent me a screenshot and said, you know, there are exercise books for writing, for penmanship uh, that are being circulated in the province. But the writing example that the students have to copy to learn their handwriting is President Marcos was the greatest president of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So on every aspect, because... One aspect of um, post-EDSA was because of the control of the dictator, there is no national control over textbooks. Every school decides on its textbooks. Every school becomes a new opportunity, if you wanted to pursue that, to inject um, something favorable to the Marcoses. Not to mention other aspects of our culture. Um, we don't like fighting. People who do official things want to sort of make everything smooth. So the textbooks um, may not dwell on, on martial law so much because it's, it's messy and controversial and will offend people. So all of these put together means there's a new generation that um, has been reached away from the schools through things like, like YouTube, with new means, why write a book when no one likes to read and you can do a video and everyone will watch it and believe it because it claims to tell you unknown truths or suppressed facts. It's very exciting and it gets into your brain. And so a whole new generation um, has been convinced. What the Marcoses didn't realize was, you know, it's a basic rule in life. For every action, there is a corresponding reaction. When people finally belatedly started noticing that it turns out YouTube was full of videos um, praising the Marcoses, that there was this rehabilitation effort going on, all of a sudden, all the, you know, gray-haired people who didn't want to talk about their traumas during martial law started talking about it. And all of a sudden... Um, for all that the Marcoses were able to succeed in having a state funeral, it libingan ng mga bayani for President Marcos, let's for, not forget one thing. It couldn't be open to the public. Mm -hmm. So they won, but in a with a barricade of, of um of firearms because it was still, you know, not uh, uh, something that could be done in in, in many ways. Uh out in the open because there's still too many people alive who suffered and who are now starting uh, to tell their story. So the end result was what we saw in 2016. Again, the Marcos has learned. So the whole time um, they kept up their innovating. So they didn't just stop at YouTube. They didn't stop at Facebook. They conquered a new... Um, field of, of operations in TikTok. And so in the beginning they were they, they were they were ruling TikTok uh, 100%. Today in Facebook uh, in Twitter um, you see that they have mastered the Aldub system where that you have different people and they will they will come out with a hashtag and everyone will push out that hashtag and therefore the whole day is spent with the supporters of other candidates all frothing at the mouth and getting angry because there's this pro Marcos hashtag. End result, uh, as more than one person has noticed, the Marcoses are, are reinforced as top of mind. You don't have to like them, but what's being reinforced in your mind is that they are the family to beat and that they are uh, unstoppable. This is something that um, they had going into 2016 and was one of the biggest um, problems they had after that. In 2016, all of a sudden, they experienced defeat again. Um, and then so it took a while for them to, to recover. Manolo, it's very interesting. You said you've looked at the votes 
of both IME and and Bong Bong, and that's about thirty percent. Is that is that from the solid north? I thought the solid north was just Ilocos Norte, but it's not a myth. It's really this thirty percent is really from the north. Well, yes. If you if you if you you can look at the. Um, actually, I did this exercise on Twitter. Um, you can find um, you can find it on YouTube. I, I mean, on on um, on um, um, you can find it online. All the electoral maps. Of course, there is the 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 solid north. Um, it may not even have all the votes, but more importantly, because of their using um, social media, they're very strong in in Luzon period. Um, where the Marcoses, interestingly, are not as strong, and again, this is historical, is in the Visayas and uh, Mindanao. Because during the time of Marcos himself, even when he controlled everything, uh, opposition, the heart of the opposition was in two places, in Mindanao and in Cebu. Um, and to a certain extent, of course, other places later on, like maybe Batangas. But Really, you, you could say that the heartland of the opposition was, was in the Visayas and in Mindanao. And today, you can see that, that the Marcos Jr. is still weaker in, the, uh, in Mindanao and perhaps not as strong in the Visayas outside of uh, the Waray heartland. So um, you, you can see it. The problem is, uh, you know, um, in, in all your reports, Marites, the... the Lingayen Lucena corridor, as they say, is where you know forty percent of all the votes are. So if you win these places and Metro Manila, you you can basically overcome the votes everywhere else. You know, it's very difficult trying to explain what's happening here in the Philippines to foreigners because f friends say, "What the Marcoses are back, and they, you know, um, they might even reclaim Malacanang." So. Maybe, can you give an analogy to these foreigners who keep asking us about it? I was asking you, I emailed you, Manolo, is it like a, a scion of Hitler, uh, you know, leading a political party and gunning to be prime minister? Or can you give us a, an analogy? No, it's a different. I mean, you'd, you'd have to, I guess, if you want to do apples to apples, it has to be um, what other families of dictators have, have come back. Well, um, the daughter of Park Chung-hee was, was elected president of Korea, um, South Korea, a few years ago. Of course, she was then impeached, um, but she made it. Um, just recently in Peru, um, the daughter of Alberto Fujimori, who had to, who, who invented the word autogulpe, which means, you know, self-coup, almost became president. A granddaughter of Mussolini was, was became a member of parliament in, in Italy. Um, these things aren't unusual, and, and it's to be expected, um, I think, in, in a democracy where, first of all, people's memories are short and where the, um, the whole idea that you have a democracy after dictatorship means many of the things that the dictatorships would have used uh, against their enemies, a, a republic, a, democ a democratic republic cannot use against those who want to use democracy's own means to bring themselves back to power. So sometimes I think we're a little too harsh on ourselves. Um, I think we can be harsh on ourselves on the fact that many of the cases against the Marcoses uh, were supposed to have been lost because people, you know, did funny business with the evidence or the cases. I think there is a case to be made that um, because of that, the Marcoses um, then took advantage of every legitimate means to, to be elected um, because the rules didn't prohibit them from, from doing so. There, I think you can do it. But I don't think we're unique in that a minority, and let's not forget, it's always a minority that does this, that a minority will remain either loyal out of past memories and nostalgia or loyal out of new brainwashing or convic conviction to support them. Um, but it still is not the case where you can say that there is a majority decision for this or a majority popularity 
for this. But there is a window of opportunity for this. Yes. Manolo, we have a question from one of our viewers, Janet Bautista. She's, she says, how can the country move on if there is no closure and apology and restitution? Uh, the Marcos didn't return what's been stolen. There's been, they didn't pay damages. There is no recognition and acceptance of offenses, abuses, corruption, and injustice. Maybe this is a question always asked of us, but uh, what's your take, Manolo? Well, I mean, I you cannot. I mean, the, the Marcoses can never ever um, admit wrongdoing. I mean, th this is the reason they have been spending thirty years to to re to regain uh, to regain a mandate, because from their point of view, um, they have been unjustly accused that they have been the victim of a conspiracy, and that they are undergoing persecution there's no other way for them to make sense of it i mean there there's, there's there used to be a saying that um mrs marcos herself after she was a young sort of you know bride had ha, couldn't bear the fact when she realized the the harsh realities of politics and then she had to seek um, help. And the basic choice she was given is, well, then either leave your husband or you just have to embrace it. And what she did, according to this theory, is that she then created a, a little bubble around herself in which everything made sense. And that is what enabled her through all these decades to, to, to hold it together. Now... Um, that may or may not be true, but it definitely is true in terms of the whole Marcos a political identity and myth. They can never um, admit to anything they are accused of. And in fact, they must seek to triumph in the end against everyone who has uh, accused them of this. Um, and along the way, by the way, part of it is, don't forget that there is a subset of the Marcos sort of constituency that I like to call the cargo cult. The cargo cult was a belief in some Pacific islands because of World War II that one day these airplanes will come bringing big, big boxes of goodies from the West and everyone will live happily ever after. The thousands that you would see going to Los Baños a few years ago and a lot of voters that, that reporters encounter are doing so because they believe that they are they are going to get a part of the Marcos billions from Yamashita's gold or whatever. And it's this whole sort of cargo cult where there will be mana for Marcos that will come. That is a big chunk uh, of their of their myth and their vote and their machinery. It's this promise that they will everyone is going to benefit. Um, and it's it's in it, it's a powerful um, argument, at least for a significant chunk uh, of the voter. And you cannot ever admit uh, that's why they will put a, a video on YouTube instead, saying that you know there was all this gold and that it went to Rizal, and then Rizal uh, left it as a as a heritage to Marcos, and then Marcos on his deathbed in Hawaii said the Filipino people will have it, and if you elect Bong Bong, all of you are going to get one hundred thousand or one million pesos as your share of the gold, um, and there are probably going to be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of voters, you know, who view the Marcoses as a lotto ticket to to prosperity. It's fascinating, Manolo. Maybe for the final question, because this is very current, uh, you said earlier that the Marcoses will never admit you know, they, that they were wrong, that they stole. Uh, but just yesterday, there was a case filed to cancel Bongbong Marcoses' um, certificate of candidacy. So how do you, well, because you've seen, you've tracked down all these cases, I mean, how the Marcoses responded. What is the move that will uh, that the Bong Bong camp can do or will do to stave off, you know, all this talk about all this publicity about his unpaid taxes on his income while he was governor of Ilocos Norte? I think I think they've already done it, and it's and it shows you the sort of effectiveness of the Marcos um, strategy. Um, on one hand. 
someone will say, poor, poor Marcos says, you know, how can they have been paying their taxes? They were being chased out of the country. Kawawa naman. Number two, um, they will say, um, you know, how can people be talking about taxes? I bet these other people making accusations don't pay their taxes, so you're deflected it. Third, um, and most effectively, because this is the official statement made by his spokesperson, is no one objected when we ran in 2016. Why are they bringing it up only now? This is manufactured. And of course, you know, some people will say yes. And in fact, um, it was Justice Carpio himself, at, le at least ac um, according to, to some uh, text messages circulating around, who had pointed out uh, Bongbong Marcos originally wanted to go all the way to the Supreme Court to contest his conviction. But when the finding was shown to not include the punishment of imprisonment, um, Bongbong then withdrew his um, appeal to the Supreme Court. Because in the end, you can always argue that since the court did not impose the punishment of imprisonment, then you cannot consider it a crime of moral turpitude. Um, these are technicalities, but in the end, um, that is, they have all the best lawyers that money can buy. Um, before uh, institutions that are still held um, by a friendly administration. So, you know, the Marcos rule is there's no such thing as bad publicity and they will always find a way to, to help reinforce the faithfulness of the faithful. Yes, I think, uh, Manolo, you said earlier about people having short memories. I just wanted to read a comment of one of our viewers from uh, Olay Uchi Torregosa. She, he or she says, ang mga Pilipino ay maiksi ang mga memoria ng mga abuses ng Marcoses malulung, nakakalungkot. But as you said, Manolo, this is not unique to us. It's, having short it's not unique. Okay. So uh, maybe one more thing. So um, this is still too early in the game. No? To, it's still May is still the elections. But again, looking back to all the elections that you've studied, read about, when will we know when the uh, when are the indications that a candidate will win? Usually, it's in the first quarter, or maybe can you give us some idea, Manolo? <laughs> because now it's really too early. And Justice Carpio was saying in one Isambayan press con that at this stage, all those who led at this stage, yes, in yes. past post Marcos elections, did not win except Estrada, I think. That you know, the the it's actually a bad thing to be the number one candidate this early in the game because you have nowhere to go but down. Um, you know, considering that that it will just um, uh, in you know sort of empower everyone else to go against you. I think it's more important for us to look at it in terms of there will be sort of benchmarks. The the one closing uh, coming up close is November fifteen because that's when substitutions ends and we'll know who, if anyone, will be the official candidate of the administration and whether that means it will either be someone with Mr. Marcos or Mr. Marcos with someone else. Then um, it will depend on how the holidays went. Uh, did we have money to spend and was business good during the, during the holidays? And then is there going to be a... Um, a new wave of COVID after the holidays. And then what happens, you know, there's a reason I remember someone was saying we always had people power in, in, in um, February. By, by January and February, everyone's bonuses are spent. And therefore, we have nothing to, to think about except how unhappy we are, if we're unhappy. If we're happy, then it's very good for the, for the administration and all those who would be running as a administration continuity candidate. So I really think it's, it's um, there's so much more to come before we can even think of what, what it will be. And one thing that does make this, um, this race very different is precisely that what's at stake is the whole idea that the family uh, has set out a vindication for itself that will overturn um, 30 years uh, of, of history. 
Yes, actually, Manolo, we still have one question from our viewers, one of our viewers, Hazel. Yao, Hazel, saan kaya po nagkulang ang mga naunang henerasyon at nahayaan na makabalik ang mga Marcoses? So, the older generation, kami yun. <laughs> um, alam mo, you know, sometimes I really feel we're too tough on ourselves. Um, that it's taking... 30 years for the Marcoses to even get this far, I think, says something of the fact that whatever the Marcoses do, uh, people won't let them forget. You know, think of, think, of just think of the past six years, which has been the most pro-Marcos um, six years since the Marcos years. Um, they couldn't eliminate the EDSA anniversary holiday, they couldn't eliminate the Nino Aquino Day, they they couldn't even change the name of the, the airport. Um, these were top of the agendas of the of the restoration plan. Um, the the fact that you know the Aquinos are all dead and the fight still goes on because it's never been about the Aquinos, I'll tell you that. Um, um, it was the Filipino people against Ferdinand Marcos in 1986. So that's the thing. I think we're doing, still doing pretty well. That they're, 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 it's not being served up on a silver platter, mm -hmm. considering the resources and the ability and the, the strategic know-how of the Marcoses. Um, sure, no one should be um, sleeping easily at night if, if this sort of restoration is a bad idea for you. But on the other hand, um, I think we should take some heart in the fact that every step of the way, they have always been opposed across different levels of society, across many institutions. Okay. Thank you so much, Manolo. I think you gave us some perspective because I've been losing sleep about, I said, what's wrong with us? So, but anyway, gave us perspective and other countries have also gone through this process. But this is not yet a successful restoration because, as you said, you know, a bong bong lost in 2016, and there's, there are obstacles along the way. So thank you so much, uh, Manolo, and to our viewers and listeners, thank you for asking questions, and we will continue this conversation uh, in the future to keep Oh, watching. wait. Can one I more? add one minute? Can I add yes, one minute? Yes, There's one yes. important point I wanted to make. Here's one, one reason, though, and, and, and this is where I've been. Um, I, the, my last column was about this. One, re, one major reason for the Marcos getting this, Marcos is getting this close to restoration is the fault of the EDSA democracy that replaced them, which is we cannot amend our constitution. And therefore, whatever we tried as an experiment, remember, as an experiment in 1987 when we got the new constitution, when we started seeing the defects and weaknesses of this, we can't figure out a way to amend the constitution and try to change our operating system. Because of this, the frustration even in, of very democratic people has nowhere to go but up. And the more you are frustrated with a system that cannot find a way to change its own rules, the more people will be tempted to look at people who promise to ignore the rules or to break the rules. And that is a very important part, not the making of the Marcoses, but the making of the system that replaced them. That's a very... Uh relevant point there's a lot of work to do for the next administration and but at least i'll say this again i'm qu quoting you that this is not yet a successful restoration mm -hmm. so and there are obstacles along the way for the marcoses and their vindication campaign thank you manolo and thank you to our viewers and listeners